so people, wow, it's too dark. So there's still time to solve the extra credit. Nobody has yet solved it. So I won't tell you anything about it until Tuesday. <laughs> You're a monster. <laughs> Did you get it? Could I have gotten it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's very, yeah, like that's a pretty, yeah, I mean, I know exactly, we're not saying, the answer is yes, I could have got there. All right, any other questions? Or five release, 26, that gives you time, so you should still start it early, but it gives you time, rather than making it do like, <coughs> during Thanksgiving, that was the idea there. Okay, so we have been talking about TCP. So somebody remind us, what is, how does TCP initiate a communication? Yeah, in the back. Three-step process. So three-step process. So in what way? Who sends what first? So initiator sends a SYN request with a sequence number of their choosing, and then what does the server or the recipient then do if they want to choose to communicate? Yeah. They return a packet with the SYN ACK flags. With the SYN ACK packet back, which then does what? What do they have in that packet? They sequence sequence number plus one. one. Their, so first, they put as their sequence number a new number, so their own sequence number, and then, and then they acknowledge the initiators sequence number plus one. All right, cool. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Okay, good. So we can see kind of a visualization of this three-way handshake. The client sends the server. Um, so these are the, this is the important information from the TCP header. So we have source port of 13987, destination port of 22. What's port 22? What is it? SSH, yeah, SSH port generates a random sequence number of 6574, acknowledgement number of zero, and sets the SYN flag to one, all the other flags to zero. Yes? Uh, from using stuff. <laughs> There's, um, there should be a file, I think it's EDC ports, or port, ports maybe, uh, which has the n uh, number name mapping. There's also the I don't know if it's ICANN, I don't know who, there is an official list of official ports also that you can look at. Yeah. I believe it's IANA. What is it? I believe it's IANA. IANA, yeah, the uh, same people that do domain names, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so anyways, there's a list, and you just, over time you start to learn the familiar ones. 22 is SSH, uh, 80 is HTTP, 443 is HTTPS, I think. Yeah. I don't know, you just kind of learn over time. It's not important, you can always look it up. It's just uh, um, Cool, okay, so the server wants to respond to this. So we, we know that in this packet that's a response, so these source and destination ports are gonna get flipped. That's uh, source port 22, destination 13987. The sequence number is now the server's new random sequence number, and the acknowledgement number is one plus the client's sequence number the SYN and the ACK flag. So SYN, SYN ACK, and then finally, the client will respond with an acknowledgement message that completes the handshake. So again, source port, destination port, sequence number of 6575, acknowledgement number of 7612. So this is showing that they're doing the same plus one operation here on the acknowledgement number that the server did for the client's sequence number. Set the app flag, so send, send, act, act. Bam, we're ready to go, and now we need to send data. But what do we want to get? So, what properties do we want to get out of the sending of, da of data? <coughs> yeah. Reliable. Reliable, which means what? Um, you know that the server actually received data from you. You want to know, or an application wants to know that data was received by the other side. Right, so that it didn't get dropped along the way. <coughs> Other things we talked about, the data didn't get duplicated, they didn't miss a byte of the communication that you sent, you know exactly how to do that. So, 
the idea is actually um, pretty simple. And the whole idea is we're going to use the sequence and acknowledgement numbers kind of as you can think of at this point, they're starting at zero. So it's all relative based on this number. And what's going to happen is whenever one side sends data to the other, they're going to wait for an acknowledgement that the other side, so every packet that comes from one side to the other, the acknowledgement will be the last bytes that they saw from the other side. So let's walk through an example of this. So continuing off of our other example, because this is going to be better because the numbers need to add up. This needs to be very particular. That's why I don't want to do it by hand. Um, so now that our circuit, our three-way handshake has been uh, done, now we want to exchange some data. So the client in this case is going to send 25 bytes of data from the client to the server. Now at this point, does the client know that the server received this? Can it say reliably that the client received these 25 bytes? No, right? It can't say anything about that. And so what the server will do, and just like before, right, this is kind of the, the nature of getting this reliable communication. We need a message back from the server that says, yes, I saw, I saw that message. And then we can know for certain that the other side is up and received the information that we sent. So what is the server going to acknowledge? So if the server sends back a packet with an acknowledgement number of this sequence number, what does that mean? Yeah. Don't you mean the sequence number plus one? So we're not doing any plus ones anymore. This is only, that's only for the initial setup. At this point, these numbers represent essentially what was the last byte that you, so if this was zero, Right? The server would send back an acknowledgement with zero that says, I've seen up to byte zero. So if we send 25 bytes to the server, we want to make sure that we saw how many bytes coming back. Twenty-five. Yeah. So what the server is going to do, it's actually fairly a simple concept. The server is going to increment the client's uh, sequence number by 25 and say, and acknowledge that and say, I've seen up to this byte. So that's exactly what happened. So the server says, my sequence <coughs> number is still at 7612 because I haven't sent you any data between here. And I, I'm acknowledging I've seen up until byte 6600. <coughs> and now when the client receives this, do they know that the other side saw those 25 bytes? Yes, absolutely, without a doubt, we know that, well, we actually don't know that it was this specific server, but we know that somebody else is acknowledging that they saw that information. So we know that the information should have gotten there, and now we're getting a response back. Yeah? Is the at flag always one after a connection is made? Yes. I think in, unless, so fin is used when you want to close the connection, uh, reset is used to reset a connection, which is kind of like, that's usually when something went wrong, but yes. So the act acknowledge flag is usually always set. Yeah. Uh, how does it deal with like uh, overflows in the sequ of the sequence number and the acknowledgement number? It just rolls over and it keeps going. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it does it very simply without anything fancy. So let's say the server in this message sends back 30 bytes of data back to the client in response to that. Then what is the client, what, what is the client going to send back to the server to acknowledge that it received that information? Yeah. The X plus 30. Yeah, so it'll take the sequence number of the server, 7612, add 30 to it, and use that as its acknowledgement number. What's it going to send as its sequence number? 6600, zero, zero, exactly. So, is that right? Good. Yeah, look at numbers add up. Always good. Right? So, in this way, so does, so in this case, this packet 
like, does the client, so in this case, the server wanted to reply to the client with some information. Here we're not sending any data. Do we still have to send this packet? Yes. Why? So the server knows that you received it. So the server knows that we received it, right? Otherwise, maybe we've never received it. So let's go over some cases uh, that can occur very briefly. <coughs> Okay, so we'll we'll start out with well, I want this to be easy. So we have our client, we have our server. The client sequence number is zero. The server's sequence number is a hundred. Easy enough. So the client sends a packet to the server that is twenty-five bytes again and has, uh, so we know it's going to have its own sequence number of 0 and an ACK of 100. So, this data never gets to the server. What does the client do? Yeah. So resends it. So yeah. So one of so one of the things is maybe this got dropped. Maybe something happens. So we can just resend it. We can retry a couple of times. Sequence zero. Act one hundred. Twenty five bytes. But now, the network all of a sudden got back up. This packet was stuck somewhere, and now the server receives two of these packets. What does it <coughs> do with them? Why does it drop the second one? Because it's already received the same one. As How does it know that it already received it? Based on the sequence number. Based it on the sequence number, exactly. So if you think about it, the data, and this is when we think of this communication as a stream, right? So think, starting at sequence number zero for the client, so this is for the client, the client has all this data they want to send. This packet is at sequence number zero containing 25 bytes, which means it is bytes well, numbering gets tricky, but the first 25 bytes, let's say, right? And we know this shouldn't be, this packet should not be any different because it's not like the application can change the bytes that it originally meant to send. That doesn't make any sense. It's trying to send this 25 bytes. So if the server receives both these packets, it'll say, oh, I already have that information for these bytes. So it actually may discard it or it may overwrite it. It kind of depends on the implementation but it would be justified in throwing those packets away. Does that make sense? So this is what, how we get non-duplication. Like we don't care about duplicated packets. We know IP can do that because there's no guarantees at the IP layer that packets won't be duplicated. But here, in this mechanism of using these sequence and acknowledgement numbers, we're able to ensure that we only have one copy of the data that is sent. So is there any difference in the case where our original packet is lost or S's reply is lost? <coughs> so we send this original message. The server sends a sequence number of 100, an ACK of 25. I've seen up to 25, and I'm sending a zero byte packet. What if that gets lost? <coughs> yeah? The client will just resend the original data into the exact same. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly the same. And it all gets, again, is a matter of perspective. So if you put yourself in the perspective of the client, what I know is that I sent this packet of 25 bytes and I never got a reply. That's all I know. You don't know if that original message got lost or the reply got lost, and you don't care. So as long as you have some mechanism to retransmit a certain number of times and give up after a certain number of times, uh, then you're good. We're not going to go into all the details here. TCP is, uh, 
has all kinds of performance enhancements and all kinds <coughs> of stuff we're actually not going to get into, but we want to understand the basic mechanisms here, specifically so we can understand how to eavesdrop and inject information in these communications. Any questions? See, it's not that crazy. Okay, and then, so we had initiating a connection, so you think about the life cycle of a communication. You initiate the communication with the three-way handshake, the send, send, act, act. You then send data, incrementing acknowledgement numbers, so always letting the other side know exactly where you are in the stream and what you've seen. Um, and then you want to stop talking, and you want to stop talking nicely. You don't want to ghost the other party and just not say anything. You want to actually end the communication because you know you're done. So it's very easy, and because remember, uh, TCP is a two-way communication circuit, so either side can communicate. Um, it's called duplex, so you can, it doesn't really matter what the term is called, but basically the client can tell the server, hey, I'm never going to send you a message again. Or I'm not going to send you any more data again, if I get the more correct way. I'm done sending data to you so it can send a thin packet, which now the server knows not to expect any more communication. The um, server will acknowledge that it saw that, and here we get another plus one to acknowledge that we actually saw that packet and we're responding to it. And we sent 30 bytes, and now the other side um, and then we can send a fin packet, and the other side will eventually acknowledge that it got all this data and that we're no longer talking to each other. And now, after all this, that virtual circuit is gone. Yeah. If a packet hangs and they've already established the fin, like finished communication, and the server receives a packet, will it just drop it? Probably. I think it depends on the implementation. Or actually, I'm sure the spec may specify what usually happens in that case is you get a reset packet where the server will send a, re a packet with a reset flag to you which it says like completely restart this transaction because something messed up, uh, this communication because something messed up completely. Uh, and that would be one of those things, like you didn't follow that spec, like I wasn't expecting you to send information so I'm gonna kill this. Yeah? Is there a protocol for like only the one who initiated the connection can, s can send the fin packet and no, because otherwise you could keep the other side hostage in some sense. Or, I mean, it kind of goes into the concept of timeouts. Like, when do you, so let's say you have it, you start a TCP connection. If no, neither side sends any data, any data, then that connection can theoretically remain open as long as possible until one side wants to send data. But you're using resources on both machines to actually keep this connection open. So. Um, you may not want to do that. You may want to time out connections and all this kind of stuff, which is why we have to deal with those. Like if you have a long running SSH session, it can be a pain, yeah. So for the shutdown, is it just, the, is the 30 bytes that the server is sending, that's just because it had more data to send? Yes. Just in general, okay. Exactly, it doesn't have to go like this. It can just be fin, fin, and we're done. Or fin, fin, an acknowledgement of the fin, and then you're done. So how does, t we said earlier with like reliability that we wanted it to like, like we don't want, we want to make sure that like bits don't get flipped or something to that effect. How does this ensure that kind of reliability? I mean, it ensures that people, <coughs> both sides are seeing it and that they're getting the same number of bytes, but the yes. content isn't like. That would be basically in the checksum. So the checksum would um, not guarantee, because it's a checksum and not a cryptographic hash, but the checksum would give you a pretty good theoretical idea that it is the same. So yeah, that's why I think when I talked about that integrity, it's not quite the integrity that we expect as security folks and in a security class, but it is some kind of integrity. So that if somebody randomly flipped a bit along the way, the other side wouldn't accept that and would drop that packet, and then the client would be able to tell because it didn't get an acknowledgement, and so it would resend that data. Other cool things, just really quickly, since we're on this topic. Um, the spec also doesn't say anything about having to only send one packet, so at a time. You don't have to send data and wait for an act and send data. 
Uh, if you have more data to send, you can send multiple things at once. Um, and there's a limit, I think, on how many in-flight packets <coughs> one side can have. I don't know, you have to look at the spec. Um, but the idea here is this is nice because you, the server can send, let's, or the client in this case, can send, let's say, 25 bytes, and then let's say, oh, it's got very quickly another 25 bytes to send. What's its sequence number that it's gonna put? 25, because it's gonna be this one plus sequence number plus 25. It's gonna acknowledge that the last one it saw was 100, and it's gonna send a new 25 bytes. So, now the question becomes, what does the server do in the case that this packet is lost and it only receives this packet? If we think about this in terms of the stream, we've received the data up till here, so what should we send as an acknowledgement when we get that second packet? Yeah. Zero. Zero, why zero? So it'll resend zero up to... Yeah, so we... Exactly. So we send, when you think about this as a stream, we send what is the byte that we have received the most data up to. So in this case, we'd say, well, we've only seen up to zero. In this case, we say we haven't seen anything, but in the general case, we could say, so let's say we send zero to 25, 25 through 50, and 50 through 75 in three different packets. And let's say the middle one doesn't show up, but the second one sends. We would then say, hey, we would send back an act that says, I'm acknowledging up to 25. I'm seeing up to 25. And then it's their responsibility to resend these next segments uh, to make sure they come back to us. Yeah? Do I hold on to 50 to 75? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think you're going to get it sent anyways because the way you acknowledge back. Uh, because, so from the client's perspective, they have no idea if you lost. 25 to 50 or 50 to 75. So they're going to send both of them to you anyways. Um, I think in this case you may keep it, but I don't know. I mean, you're probably going to overwrite it when that new packet comes in anyways. So. Is there a limit to how much data you can send? Yes. Packet? So uh, we're not going to talk about it because um, there's uh, this is not a dedicated networking course. We're covering at a high level the at a high low level, the things that we need to study in order to understand how these exploits work or how we can attack these things. Um, there's a concept known as a TCP window where one side tells you, I will only accept up to this many bytes in flight. Otherwise, don't send me any more. Because you can think about overloading another machine by sending way too much information. And you have all kinds of devices on a network, right? You have massive servers and you have tiny embedded like Raspberry Pi devices with little memory. Yeah. If, if um if I was like a malicious attacker yes. and I was like receiving packets from like a server, could I just say like I've never seen anything and have them continually resend? Sure. Uh, you could. At a certain point, they will think that there's too much packet loss or too many packets are getting lost, and they'll just stop the connection. So you have to think of what you're really getting out of it. Yeah. Is there a standard way that the checksum operates where you could like theoretically flip multiple bits so that you still get a positive on the checksum at the end? Oh, for sure, yes. Uh, this, I believe it uses like CRC32, um, but I'm not 100% certain. I don't do it in this class. In my grad <coughs> class, I have an assignment where they basically have to break CRC32 and create another file that has the same checksum. So it's very easy, actually, to do. Yeah. In that case, what would happen? Like, are there like? It would just, it would just work just fine. Well, I mean, it depends on the application, right, of what you're actually able to do. But yeah, it would just be, you get, you'd send some stuff, and what you sent is not what was received. So this is why, <coughs> for a lot of protocols like HTTPS, you need another layer on top of TCP that does encryption and integrity of what we would expect, so that we can cryptographically guarantee what we sent is what is received. Um, and that uses all the encryption stuff we talked about. All right, cool. Uh, there's a lot of other information here, but we hit the good ones. Okay, cool. Any more questions on the operation of TCP? Because now we're going to go into the how we can go through the attacks that we've looked at before. Yeah. So for the last one here, mm -hmm. how 
all kinds of stuff when you know the uh, flying uh, the last one. This one? Said, no, no, that, uh, this one? Sorry. This one? Oh my god. So the server is in 30 bytes. Yeah. How can it know the, the flying gun? Ah, it uses this. So the the thing is, this fin means that I will no longer send you data. Not I'm not going to send any more packets. So it could it will it will acknowledge that it received these bytes. So this acknowledgement should be 30 bytes above this sequence number to say I've received those bytes. And then this additional one is from this fin. So it's part of that fin that says, okay, I've seen up to or I've seen 88. 07, which is 8777 plus 30. And this fin means that I, uh, I'm acknowledging by this by incrementing me as one. So I saw that, yeah. What if it's just a response to that, the last one? If it was just a response to this, it would be 8807, and then there'd be another acknowledgement message with 8808 to acknowledge this. So it kind of depends on the timing here and exactly what happens. Way handshake? I don't know, two way handshake? Like, nobody really cares. I, I don't know. Like, I think. Uh, like three way in the sense that you have to send a request to, to like, end the connection and the server response. <coughs> and then, oh, it's just two way. Huh? Right, yeah, because you just say, I'm done talking, and they say, great. Okay, yeah. And then they could still send you data, and then you, they would say, now I'm done talking, and then you would say, great, and now you're completely done. But there are two directions, so it's kind of like a two two way handshakes mm -hmm. in some sense. So yeah, it's a little bit different, and you know, there's all kind of, you could probably explore the spec and figure out all kind of weird stuff of what happens if you, like, what happens if you set a fin and then they sent you, you acknowledged it, but then acknowledged the previous one with the resend data. Like, I have no idea. There's all kinds of weird ways that networks can break and protocols can break. There may be really interesting security vulnerabilities present. But if you're interested in networking stuff, we have a number of networking courses. We go all super deep in this stuff and understand exactly how all these things work with window sizes and the TCP. Uh, the other question is what to do when you drop a packet, because that means there's likely congestion in the network. So there's questions of how fast do you send packets, how do things communicate. Um, there's interesting differences between what the spec says you should do and what modern operating systems do because networks have gotten faster and better and more reliable. So there's optimizations you can make, but that changes other things. I mean, networking is a super complex topic. For our purposes, though, going back to reconnaissance, what did we want to know about the UDP applications running on a remote system? Versions. We also want to know what applications were running in the first place, right? <coughs> so that was the concept of the port scan. So similarly, we want to do the same thing with TCP. So how do we do that? Yeah. Uh, scan the ports. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> how do you build NMAP to do it? Yeah. ICMP packets. Uh, ICMP packets will not will are at the level of IP. They have no concept of ports, I believe. Oh, I don't know if that's 100 percent true, but yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. We can just send SIM packets everywhere. Send SIM packets everywhere. Okay, so just like every type of port scan, right? We can send SIM packets to every single port on the remote system. And what is our way of telling if that service is up or not? They'll respond. They'll respond how? No. The Synac? Synac, yes. Yes, I know. Uh, so if we send a Syn and there's an application listening, it will send us a Synac back. And then we can send a Syn, or we can send an ACK and, and then close the connection. So that would be one way to do it. Uh, what if there's no application listening on that port? What would we expect the system to do? Maybe nothing. How could we figure out what should it do? 
if there's no application running. Oh, wouldn't it sound like there's nothing going on? What was the packet call like about? Yeah, so it depends on the spec. We'd look at the TCP spec and we'd see what happens, what should happen if an application is not running or the, um, the remote system is not expecting incoming SYN packets. I believe in most systems it'll send a reset. So it's actually pretty easy. We send 65,000 whatever packets to the system, one for each port, and we look at what we get back. If we get back Synax, then we're good. Um, yes, question. So can only one, like if you have like a connection, like an application listening to a port, can only like one port be used at any given time for an application? Yes. Well, one port per <coughs> protocol. So that was the thing we talked about on Tuesday. So. I did talk with some people, and I think you looked it up in class, right? Um, so you can have one application or two applications listen on the same port, one TCP, one UDP, that's fine. But you can't have multiple applications on your machine listening for incoming connections on the same port with the same protocol. Does that also mean that like multiple incoming connections cannot like go to the same port? So like two people, does that make sense? Two people can't connect to like the same port at the same time for the same application? Why not? It can't be different applications, but yeah. depending on how you write your server application, you would write it to loop over all incoming connections. So anytime the operating system gets a new connection, it'll call your program, you'll deal with it, and then this is when you need multi-threading or multi-process in order to actually handle and respond to that, but you can have any number of open connections as an application. Yeah, so you don't need to worry about that. You need to worry about handling it and what that means, but you don't have to worry about not getting that incoming connection. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. How do we know there's nothing running on the port? On Tuesday you said that if you get nothing, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing. So that was with UDP, because UDP is has no built-in way of saying there's nothing listening here. TCP has this concept of a three-way handshake, so it has built-in. If you send a SYN and you're not expecting it, send a reset, I believe is in the, the protocol. So if you send a SYN to a port that it's not nothing is listening, the operating system will send you back a reset. Um, if you send a SYN to a port where something is listening, the operating system knows that, and it will send you back a synapse to start the communication. Uh, ah, it's ETC services is the name, so it's not ports. If you look on a Unix machine, uh, which includes Mac machines, I think, if you look at ETC services, it shows you the port uh, and like short name mappings. Um, so the very simple way to do this is use the uh, call connect. So just connect to every different port on that operating system, on that uh, remote system. And you know if the handshake is successful, then the service is available. So what is connect? And how can we figure out what connect is? What do I mean by what is it? Easy question. What kind of a function is it? Who does this connect? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't. It, I would assume it sends like a, a TCP SYN packet with like the SYN flag. But what it does? Uh, the, the, the OS. And how do we figure out if that's the case? We look at the manual for connect. Come on. Which is what we're going to do now. You've made me do this. Drop this on yourself. <coughs> yeah. We'd read the documentation. That should be your number one. <coughs> of course, this won't work, which will be funny. Okay, cool. So, uh, and we'd have to read all of this to figure out. You can actually get very far on uh, network programming just with uh, with the man pages. I think I wrote a server once on a plane just using man pages. It was actually really fun. Uh, like all the information is in here. You just have to figure out where to get it. Um, so, okay, so I guess it doesn't say, uh, system calls, great. So this is BSD, but whatever, we can ignore it for now. It's basically the same style as, as Linux. So it's a system call, which means the operating system is doing this, right? Which means the operating system is going to handle the SYN, SYNAC, everything for us. So what applications can call a connect, can call the connect function? Sorry, system call, we should call it a function. Yeah. Root access? Yeah. Root? So only root applications? 
should be able to make outgoing connections. Uh, is it in like any application as long as they accept a request that the operating system does it for them? Yeah, think about your computer, right? So every application that you're running that's <coughs> making an outgoing request is calling that function to connect to some remote system. So any application should be able to run it, so we don't need to be root. So it's actually, and this is what is nice about this. We can scan another machine without being root on our current machine. Um, how many? So let's say we're scanning all 65,535 ports on a remote system. How many packets will be sent with this? Yeah. So if, if the protocol of the operating system says it's like it sends four and it gets no response and it times out, it would be that times OK, so yeah, so it depends on what the, what the spec does. It also depends on how many open ports there are. So we think, at the least, we're going to send out 65,535 SYN packets. And then the remote side, for every um, application that's not running, it will send us back a reset. And then for every application that is running there, what's it going to send us back? A SYN ACK. And then what are we going to send back? <coughs> An ACK. So that's like, what's that, three packets per open port and two packets per closed port. It's kind of a lot of um, traffic. And you can uh, do this pretty easily. Nmap has this option of, I believe it's uh, ST, and it will look at all the ports doing connect scanning. So if you just look at connect scanning, it will do that. Yeah? So what if there's an application running on a port, but it just rejects all same so what do we get back? You would get back that that port is closed. And if you think about it, if there is an application listening on there, how could you talk to that application? But how, if it's, if it's not sending back a SYNAC, how could you talk to that? And the question is, from your perspective, what's the difference between it being closed, or between no application listening, and it never sending you a Synax back. Yes. There's no difference, right? In my mind, right? So if there's no application listening, you send back a reset. Yes. But if, it, if there is one, if we, and it doesn't want to talk to you, it will also send back a reset. No, I think, well, it's probably possible to write an application that does that directly. In general, if you're writing a normal application, it would create a three way handshake. The server then now knows your IP address, and then you could say, like, kill the connection because I don't accept connections from that IP address. Does that make sense? Because that's usually how you base the blocking from. But you'd still need to, like, yeah, you'd still need to, like, talk to that application. Yeah. Um, with connect scanning, just in scanning in general, um, in map at least, does it actually use, like, banner graphic fingerprinting, or is it just coordinating resolution? this does is look up in your in EDC services and maps the ports to the name. I, actually, Nmap itself may have a better list, I don't know, but uh, yeah, fundamentally I don't think it does anything beyond that. It, it may have additional options, definitely not the options we're using here. Yeah? Is there a way to end the connection other than Finn? Because doesn't Finn just say, I'm not sending any more data? Couldn't you still theoretically send more data into the connection? You theoretically could. I mean, you can always send whatever packet you want to any other machine at any point, right? The question is, what are they going to do with it, right? So in that case, the other side would probably ignore it, but said, hey, you said you're not talking to me, so I'm just going to ignore this data. Um, or it could say, whoa, this is really crazy. Something must have messed up. I'm going to reset my connection with you, so it's going to be basically broken. Any other questions? So, yeah. Oh. How many bits are there for to represent a port in a TCP header and a UDP header? Uh, yeah. I mean, it has to be based on the 65, right? So, cool. Okay, so now if we, but how can we make this faster?
What is the, so what bit of information for each port are we trying to learn? Is, is there an application listing exactly? At what point through this process do we learn that bit of information? Yes, uh, you, your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Answer anyways. When, when, they, uh, when they reply to our SYN request. Right, when they reply with a SYN act, right? We don't actually need to reply with our final act to start that communication. Um, so this is known as like SYN scanning or half open scanning, where we don't, we never finish the three-way handshake. So we send a SYN packet, the server answers with the SYN act if the port is open or with a reset if the packet is closed. So this is what's nice is we again have that statement to be able to tell what it does. And again, the really interesting thing here, as we're going to see, it's just that one bit of information is what we're trying to learn, right? Is that application open or not? And all we can do is feed external inputs to try to figure that out. So we're looking at what's the difference, what does the TCP IP stack do if we send a SYN packet to a port when an application is listening or not listening? And here, so we can send a reset packet or we can send, uh, we can just not send anything and let that connection time out. One of the benefits here is this connection is never actually officially open, so it may not be logged. So if you have devices uh, looking like in most operating systems, it won't log and say, hey, there was a connection. The application will never get that notification that says there is a connection from this IP address. Um, because there wasn't. There was only the start of a connection, and then something <laughs> happens. That makes sense. So, are, are some ports like TCP specific, and some ports are UDP specific, or there are various port numbers that are more and protocols. Like I think it's more there are very applications that are specific to each port, and there are applications that use specific protocols. Like DNS uses uh, is port fifty three, I believe UDP. I may admit, is it fifty two? Somebody knows, let me know. Uh, but you can also run a DNS server on TCP. Like, that's totally possible. Uh, it doesn't have to be UDP, but it is for most purposes. So, yeah, it's just kind of like there's UDP based applications and they are tied to specific ports, and there's TCP based applications that are tied to specific ports. Yeah? So, is this saying that it won't log your IP address? It may not. It yeah, may depending on the, what the operating system does. So yeah, because if it's logging, let's say, every incoming connection, or you think about a web server, right? Anybody look at a web server log? Like, I can look at, it actually freaked me out one time. I was looking at the logs of the submission system after I had created a homework assignment submission or something, and I was looking through the logs and I saw people starting to hit that assignment before I'd released it, and I freaked out. <laughs> And then I was like, wait, Ferris, are you looking at the assignment right now? He's like, yes. <laughs> so I was like, okay, good, this makes sense. Like I thought, it's, because I, I restricted it so only admins could see that. And so if I wanted you to be able to see that, you'd like broken into one of our accounts, uh, which I was very worried about. So uh, anyways, the server will, will only log incoming connections when it has a new TCP connection, right? And then it will create a log entry in the HTTP log that, hey, this IP made this request. If you never initiate the connection, there was never a request to log, so it would not log it there. It may be logged somewhere else. It's all, I'm sure it's possible to configure an OS to log these things, but usually by default they won't be logged. And so that looks like uh, Nmap, you can use the dash S option. And so here on this system, we can see that port 80, the HTTP port is open, and uh, we can look at the TCP dump of traffic from this machine. So we can see that here we have the SYN from uh, 128, 111, 48, 69 port, whatever, the random port doesn't matter, to 128, 111, 41, 38, which is the, that's not right. Yeah, yeah, that's right, wait. No, this 41 should not be here, because it's port 78. What is going on? Yes, okay. <coughs> All right, whatever. 
that's super weird. But uh, anyways, these last, this is the port number for all of these. So it's sending SYN packets to all of these ports. And then it looks back a reset. So there's a reset packet from port 78. So we know 78 is closed. A reset packet to port 81. A reset packet to <coughs> port 82. And then a um, SYN, this is the uh, SYNAC packet to port from port 80, which means that's open. And then we, I guess this uh, version of MF resets that so it never starts the connection. Um, and there's various other ways. I won't go into all of them, but there's all kinds of ways that they do, you can do it. If you look through the man page of Nmap, you can look at all the different crazy options there. And it's all about this idea of when I send this packet to a specific port on a specific machine, does the TCP IP stack give me a different response if there's an application listening or not? Some of the things they do are what happens if I, it's called a Christmas tree scan, where what happens if I set every single option flag in the TCP packet? So what if I send a sin, ack, uh, fin, reset, all of those, what does it do? And does it do something different if uh, there's an application running? It turns out yes, in a lot of cases it does. Or a null, there's a null scan of what happens if you send all zero bytes, like no, no flag set, um, you know, all kinds of weirdness. You can even go more complicated of exactly what we were talking about. What happens if you send a sin and then a reset? What does it do? Uh, does it do something different? So this is all cases where you can fingerprint based on this, and you may have to go into the specifics of how different operating systems go and use. So this is useful for finding out what services are running on the remote system, but how do we know what operating system they're running? And is that a useful piece of information? Yeah? You can get Nmap to get the version for you, slash D. How does it do it? <laughs> yeah, why is that useful? <coughs> Because uh, there might be some vulnerabilities for a specific OS, so you can exploit that. Yeah, we maybe see that they're running Windows XP, right? And there's tons <laughs> of old vulnerabilities for Windows XP. Or even just a two-month out-of-date version of the latest operating system could have known remote exploits that you can use to take over. Plus, it gives you information about if they're running a whatever. If you see there's an HTTP server and you also find out it's a Windows host, it's likely that web server is IIS. Um, if it's a Linux host, it's probably likely to be Apache or Nginx or one of these things. So that helps you kind of refine what you're looking at and what you're looking for. But yes? How do you find out the operating system through Nmap? We'll see that there is an option, but we care more about why, how it works. So how can we do this? It seems like a very counterintuitive problem. The problem is there's some remote system. Do we have access to the source code of that system? No, do we have access to even execute things on that system? So it's a complete black box to us, but what can we do? We can talk to it and we can send packets to it. That's about it. That's the only thing we can do. Um, and the idea is kind of building on this port scanning idea and this port scanning concept and saying, okay, what does Windows do if you send it a packet with all the flags set? Is that different than, so if you think about the TCP or UDP or IP, whatever, if you think about um, their protocols and you study their protocols, they will tell you very well of exactly how it should work in the good cases. Specifications are usually very vague and leave out information of what to do in every single weird corner case that could ever happen. And so who decides what happens in those weird corner cases? The, well, I wouldn't say the OS, it makes it sound sentient. The OS developer, right? So yeah, the, develop, the developers who wrote the operating system, they need to figure out, what do I do if I receive a crazy packet? Right, what do I do if I receive a f data after a fin <coughs> packet, or a reset packet, or a, I don't know, and how do I choose my window size, and what do I do if I drop packets? All these are decisions that are made by each individual implementation and so by studying and compiling this big, large tree of differences, 
you can actually remotely fingerprint the <coughs> operating system version by using these as kind of individual tests. Um, so what happened if, uh, so all kinds of weird things like, and also you get, uh, it's not just like unbehind, uh, undefined behavior in the spec, but sometimes not following the spec correctly. So do they reply incorrectly to a fin packet? Um, that could be one way of fingerprinting it. Um, what happens if we do weird combination of flags in the TCP header? Is there a pattern in how they select the initial sequence numbers that we can use to fingerprint and detect the operating system? Uh, what about the window size? How do they use ICMP messages? We saw that when we were sending UDP packets to unknown ports, there was a limit on Linux to, I think it was eight messages per second that it would respond to. Does that same thing exist on Windows? Does it send us a response or not, right? Each of these responses leaks bits of information from the system about what is running on there. Um, error rates, TCP options. Um, the crazy thing is that there's a tool called the POF, <coughs> which you can use on a data packet or just on the data that can try to infer passively without injecting any traffic what are the operating systems of the, the machines you're talking to. Um, yeah? So if you like knew how Nmap sent out packets or something, is it possible to spoof them? Like spoof your OS or somebody else's OS to make them think that you're using something that you're not? Yes, for sure. Oh. Yeah, you could, you'd have to tweak your OS Tweaking the settings would be easiest if you could figure out what settings it uses to figure things out. Um, but it'd be, I'd say it'd be difficult because a lot of these are kind of structural code based things. So you, you're basically kind of changing your TCP IP stack to be more like Windows, which is weird, right? So you're probably gonna introduce some other problems in there. I would not recommend it. And then you may find out your web server is leaking, like it puts Ubuntu Linux in the response Better. So <laughs> you did all this work at this level and forgot about other stuff. Um, yeah, questions on this? So Nmap uh, it does have an option. I think it's dash capital O is the one that does this. Um, that does OS fingerprinting. I think this is just super cool. Like, if you try this on your own machine, see what it says. Uh, it's a little weird now with all the like mobile devices and everything, so things get muddy, but it still does work decently well. So and gives you at least a good kind of target point. And it can even tell you, the other thing they do is they look at different versions of operating systems. So let's say generally <coughs> we can figure out a Windows machine. Now we know that Windows 7 does this behavior in this certain conditions that they changed in Windows 8, and then Windows 10 does something different in a different circumstance. So this way you're able to kind of detect even versions of operating systems, yeah. Does it do the same for the application versions? It, theoretically, yes, it is hard to, and I think that does exist for various specific applications, but for most apps, uh, I don't know of a tool that does this automatically, that can like generate this ability to fingerprint manually. Um, but there's all kinds of, this concept of fingerprinting comes up a lot. Like there's, uh, when you're browsing the web, um, various like add JavaScript it tries to fingerprint your browser so that that way even if you clear your cookies or whatever, it can link you. Like that's oftentimes how it knows it's you even if you're using private mode or other kinds of things. Um, because it's using, creating fingerprints based on the browser, everybody's installed browsers are gonna be slightly different and machines are different and all kinds of stuff. Okay, cool. So now I wanna to move to how can we spoof, so now we wanna look at our old friends of IP spoofing and IP hijacking and say, how does that work now in a TCP connection? So if we go back to what we had and what we wanted, we have our good friends, Alice and Bob. And they want to communicate with each other. Alice wants to initiate a connection to Bob. What is Alice sending to Bob? Sympathetic packet. So we want to, let's say we want to spoof. So let's say we want to spoof a connection 
let's say from Alice to Bob. So we're Eve. We want to pretend to be Alice to Bob. How can we do that? So what packet do we have to initially send? <coughs> we have to send a sin packet, right? What does that sin packet look like? So it has some sequence number. It has a sin flag. We know the from of uh, the uh, source port is whatever we put, doesn't matter. Uh, the destination port is whatever port we're trying to say. Let's say this is a, and so what scenario would this be? Let's say this is a web server that only allows, or it allows admin access only from certain IP addresses, and that's Alice. So this happens a lot, so we wanna spoof. Oftentimes this is even local networks, so that's another trickier thing, but um, let's say that we know Alice's IP, we know if we're able to spoof a connection coming from Alice, we can access whatever secret information we want. So the destination port's 80, our source port's good, and then so what's our source IP? Alice. Alice. Alice's IP, yeah, it can't be our IP. Our IP. And the destination IP? Bob's. Right? And this is all in all the headers of the packet that we want to send. Is there anything in what we studied that prevents us from doing this? No. No. Everyone agree with that? <coughs> there wasn't enough nodding heads. Okay, Bob gets this packet. Does he give us that secret sensitive information that we so desperately want? No. no. What does Bob do? Send something to Alice. Send yeah. to Alice. Synac to Alice. So Bob will create a Synac packet. And where does that go? Alice. It goes to Eve? Why does it go to Eve? Because she asked nicely. So let's think about this packet, this Synac packet. So the the ports, the source port will be, sorry, the blah, the destination port will be whatever we sent here. The what's the source port? Eighty. 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 What, so it will have, uh, we'll call this Eve sequence number for right now. So it'll be sequence number of Eve plus, actually this will be the sequence number of Bob. And it will have the acknowledgement of the sequence number of Eve plus one. And it will have what flag set? Yeah. <coughs> Great. And then what about the IP? Alice. What's the source IP? Yeah. <laughs> Computers. So source IP, Bob's IP, destination IP? Alice's IP. Cool. So what happens to this packet in the network? We've studied how packets move through the network. Yeah. Are we on a local network? Let's say no. Okay, then it goes to Alice. Then it goes to Alice. Well, either way, it's going to go to Alice, right? It just so depends on how. We could do if you're on a local network, that can change. Yes, okay. So assuming we are not on that, on the local network, this packet will get sent back to Alice. Alice gets this packet, and what does Alice do? So think about it a different way. Is Alice expecting this packet? No. No, no. so she's gonna say, go away, Bob, stop talking to me. <laughs> reset this communication, something weird happened. Alice will send a reset packet to Bob, and then Bob will terminate this connection. So, are we completely screwed as Eve? Can we not do anything? No. 
What do we want? What's our goal? To talk to Bob as Alice, how do we accomplish that goal? How do we need to accomplish that goal? Yeah? I think we need to either intercept or uh, stop it, the spin packet from Alice. Why? That way we could modify it to come back to us. Not quite. Almost. I think you're, you're giving. So we need to get the, uh, the sequence of the, the... Wait, wait. Higher level, right? We want to we wanna make a request to Bob. How do we get there in terms of TCP? Three-way handshake. We need to establish a three-way handshake first before we can even make a request to Bob. Right? We've made the first part. Eve made the first sin request to Bob. We don't do the sin act. We are not Bob. Bob sends us a sin act back. So why don't we just send from Eve to Bob an act packet, send sin act act, to finish that connection? Wouldn't Alice still send like a reset packet? Sure, but let's not work. Let's say we're super. Alice is in the other side of the Earth, and the thing's got to come up in satellites, and we're much closer. Yeah. Are we assuming that Eve knows the Synac packet that Bob sent, or no? Why? How does that change things? Well, because if Eve doesn't know, then it can't respond with the acknowledgement. Why not? Because it doesn't know Bob's uh, sequence number. Yes. Oh, I think I have colors, but I don't know how to use them yet. Oh, there we go. How about this? Why would that be correctly? <laughs> yeah, any sense. yeah. So, the entire security of this whole thing without, so if we assume that Eve has no knowledge of this packet that Bob sends, Eve would need to create an act packet that acknowledges the sequence number of Bob plus one in order to start this communication. Otherwise, Bob will ignore any packets we send to him. So how can we do that? I believe it's a 32-bit number. It's going to be tricky. Yeah. If we intercepted uh, Bob Sinak, then we would If know. we intercepted Bob Sinak, how can we do that? studied a lot of ways to do that. Yeah. Spoof their IP. Spoof, we're already, wait, say that again? Spoof their IP, like Alice's IP. We're already spoofing Alice's IP. But we can't receive spoofing IP packets. We can send, so the way you think about it, we can send a packet with any source IP that we want. We can only receive packets more or less that have our destination, which is why we're not going to receive that Synac back from Bob, I guess unless we get up to the BGP level and we're able to pretend it has a... <laughs> Could we listen on that uh, communication? How? Be more specific. We've talked to, we've studied network <coughs> for two weeks now. Yeah. If we're on the same network as Bob, we could pretend to be his gateway through our poison? Yeah, so if we're on the same local network as Bob, we can poison the gateway of Bob in order to get that <laughs> Synac packet. And then we're actually in the middle, we can drop that packet and never send it to Alice, so she never sends the reset. That's one way, what else? Yeah. Hardware. Hardware? If so you have yeah. access to the hardware, you can just Who's, it. who's hardware? The wiring from the building. Yeah, okay, so good, so, right, I'm drawing this arrow, but we actually know there's like switches along the way and there's physical communications. So as long as at any point along here, if you've compromised any of this, as long as you can see that send act packet, you can reply with the correct act. What else? Yeah. You said an app reply, so what things are Alice's IPs that are mesh? We could do that in what, which case? When can we do that? So what has to be true? We, well, we're only going to get that ARP request if we're on the same local network as Bob. So if we're on the same local network as Bob, we can do play kind of our poisoning games, and we can play um, well, all kinds of games. Uh, poison the gateway. But that's not the only place. Yeah. If Bob sent it via Wi-Fi, we can send it from there. Yeah, depending on the security of this link. So basically, every link along here, we could sniff stuff out and get that hack. Yeah. 
I was gonna say, if we were on Alice's local network, we could also do art poisoning there, right? Yeah, so just thinking there's nothing special really about being on Bob's local network. We could be on Alice's local network and still do art poisoning to get that packet, right? So this, um, a lot of abilities to do that, but very much unlike IP, we need to be able to, so if you think about this, the security of this whole scheme Oh, there's also other ways, yeah. No, I was saying, aren't we There assuming, are other ways. Aren't we assuming that we're not on local network? Uh, I said that at the start, wow. Well, I said at the start, we're assuming we're not on the local network. And then it's like, what scenarios could we get that information? And one is being on Bob's local network. Another one would be being on uh, e uh, Alice's local network. And possibly any of the local networks in between. You could also maybe intercept things there, but yeah. What else? So somebody, why, why did you care about how many bits, the, like the size of the sequence number? I just forgot. No, but why is that important? <laughs> just because you're curious and you forgot? Like, why do you want to know that size? Yeah. You can brute force it. You can brute force it or guess it, right? What if this sequence number is just based on the current time? Or what if the sequence number is always zero? Or what if the sequence number uh, just, I don't know, increments by 10 every second? Right? So this is the other thing. So the security of this whole scheme relies on the randomness of the sequence number and not being able to intercept it along the way. If we can get that, then we can spoof TCP connections and pretend to be other people on the network. Yes, it would be very noisy. It would all depend on how much, right? I mean, brute force, so brute forcing, uh, if, if you assume it's a completely random value, then you would need, what, 2 to the 32, which is like 4 billion requests. Like, you'll never make that in the time it takes Alice to respond, right? Um, but if you can winnow that down because you know, like maybe you make a connection to Bob first, and you know that his operating system has a relationship <coughs> between sequence numbers, and you use that to search around that and maybe get it. Another nice thing is you only need to get B right once, right. so you can continually do this. But yes, the more guessing you have to do, the noisier it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, are sequence is there typically a relationship between sequence numbers and like the time in the operating system, or are they it used to be? Yeah. Now they're r more random. They should be. <laughs> I'm not going to stake my life on it, but. Uh, yeah, so this was um, this has been known for a long time, since back in 1985, of uh, doing this. Um, ba -ba -ba. Cool, OK. Uh, yep, yeah, this is everything that we did. Uh, one thing you can do is you can take down this machine. So you can, if you want to impersonate that IP, you just send a bunch of packets to flood that so it never gets the, the SIMAC from the machine you're trying to uh, get into. Um, so you send the SYN, it sends a SYN act to that machine, it's being flooded by packets from you, so it never gets it, and then you somehow guess, get lucky, get the, get the sequence number plus one, and do that. It is possible, because you think about anybody on your local network could basically do that. Um, the next thing is hijacking. So what was the idea behind hijack, well, what was the idea behind UDP hijacking? How is that different from spoofing? Yeah. We send packets into an existing communication. Yeah, so we want to hijack. You can think of it as like data injection, right? So if you're thinking about an HTML, so a web page, right? I may want to inject some JavaScript code in that response that takes advantage of a exploit, of a, sorry, takes advantage of an exploit in your browser in order to get me code execution on your machine. Those are things that actually happen that people do. Um, and so the technique is very, very similar. Um, there's an early paper on this that you can check out. But the idea is exactly, so again, we have exactly the same problem. Because if we want to inject, let's say two machines are talking to each other, we want to inject some data into there. What do we have <coughs> to know? The sequence numbers of both sides, right? Or of, to be able to properly do that. Otherwise, they'll be dropped and ignored. So again, we have the same limitations where we need to be either a person in the middle of the communication to be able to see the communication, 
or we need to be on the local network of either of these clients and servers. But um, okay, but yeah. Uh, so that's actually pretty easy, and it's very similar to what uh, what we've done. The problem is very quickly. I want to move on. You can't see this. Okay, good. I mean, not good. But. Okay, just as we saw here. So you have the client and the server. The client has sent, let's say, a hundred bytes. The server has acknowledges 100 bytes, and they're not talking, and now this is the time we want to inject some information. So we inject as Eve a packet spoofing from the client to the server. We get the acknowledgement numbers correct, and we send 100 bytes. What is the server going to send when it gets that reply or get that, gets that new data? Yeah. Isn't it going to update its uh, acknowledgement number by 100 and send it back to its uh, Yeah, eight? it'll reply with an acknowledgement number of 200. What's the client going to do when it gets that? <coughs> yeah, it'll actually send a message with this uh, with a sequence number of a hundred and be like, uh, actually, I've only sent you up to a hundred. And then when they get that, the other side will acknowledge that the last thing they saw was two hundred. <laughs> and this oh side will send a sequence of a hundred. And this will actually continue basically forever. And to, because essentially, if you think about it, you desynced both of the views, right? The client thinks they've only sent 100 bytes. The servers received 200 bytes, but the client doesn't know about it. So to solve this, you either need to man in the middle and change these sequence numbers so they're correct, or you just leave it. Because at one point, one of these packets will get dropped because they'll just be constantly talking back and forth. One will get dropped, and each side goes, yes, that's what I thought. Like, we are at 100. The other side, we are at 200. But now they can actually no longer communicate because they can't send any data to each other because their sequence numbers are off. Um, so it's the idea of de like the, the communication becomes desynced, which you can read about more here. Um, so yeah, it generates an act storm. It's actually really cool uh, to look at. It won't like time out at all. No, because they're yeah, they're just. I mean, it's part of the protocol. It's like trying. yeah, nobody's losing packets, but each side is seeing the wrong packets come back, so they resend what they think is the truth, and the other side sends the truth back. So it's like they just keep arguing until one of them can't hear one's argument. Okay, so we talked about denial of service. Um, I'm going to briefly go over, well, no, uh, we're so close. All right, we're going to finish this out because I want to talk about binaries on Tuesday. Uh, okay, so we, the one thing we haven't looked at is availability attacks in the network. Um, these are actually used to be incredibly common as machines and bandwidth got better. Being able to send enough information or bandwidth to a system to take it down is more difficult. Um, but now with the rise of botnets and IoT devices where people have harvested you know, uh, 300,000 routers on the internet and controlled them to send traffic to one machine, they're actually able to perform super sophisticated denial of service attacks. Um, one of these is just sending SYN packets to a machine. So the attacker starts with a SYN, the victim replies with a SYN act, and the attacker does nothing. Why is this a useful denial of service? The victim keeps sending SYNAC files, right? Uh, it will, that's a good question. I actually don't know. Let's say it doesn't, because that doesn't affect what we're looking at here. Yeah. Will the victim like just keep waiting for like the... It'll keep waiting, and what is it doing while it waits? What have we caused to happen on that system? Yeah. There's some overhead to tracking that it is waiting for a response. Because it needs to keep track of that sequence number, right? It has to store this IP, this port, I've used this sequence number, so there's some state associated there. What does the attacker have to store here? Just one where it's sending. Yeah, I mean, nothing, it's constant, right? Yeah. It's just sending SYN packets and never cares about getting the acknowledgement or doing that. So basically, all availability attacks <coughs> and denial of service attacks require some form of leverage. So here, I can send one packet that costs me nothing, 
but it costs you whatever, 20, 30 bytes to store that, and I can keep sending as many as I want, and you will keep storing all of those until you can't store any more, and that means legitimate people trying to connect to your system won't be able to, so it'll be down for them. Um, and the super cool thing about this, and we know because we've studied IP packets, if we don't care about the response and responding to the SYNAC, we can put whatever source IP we want. So we can make this attack appear to come from anywhere because we don't have to initiate this connection. Um, so this is a, so you can, uh, anyways, there's a lot of ways to solve this. One is to change your sequence numbers using this idea of SYN cookies to uh, have an algorithm where you don't actually store any information on a SYNAC packet. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, I don't <coughs> want to go into them. Uh, all kinds of stuff here. So you can create connections, uh, actually create connections. You can overload the number of processes and the number of threads that are listening to there. So this was a common attack against uh, multi-process Apache servers that fork a new process for every connection. You just make a hundred or a thousand connections. There's a thousand uh, processes running on this server and the server grinds to a halt because it can't keep up with all of this. Uh, this is pretty crazy. So this is like what we just talked about of forcing the other machine to store memory for you. So as a malicious client, you could send, let's say the data for a whole window size and never send like the beginning size. So they have to store all this data and they're just waiting for you to send that final byte so they can acknowledge everything. Um, and you could do that and never do that and send that from multiple sides. Um, all right, very briefly, firewalls. Everyone heard of firewalls? Cool. So there, when we think of terms of policies and mechanisms, firewalls are mechanisms to enforce a network access policy. So if you think about it, as an organization, you want to make sure what incoming connections are actually what you expect them to be, is kind of the way I think about it. Um, things like your web server should only allow incoming TCP connections to port 80. You don't need everyone on the internet to SSH to your server or to access any other ports. So you have a device that sits on your network or software running on your system to drop all those other packets. So most op uh, operating systems now actually have built-in firewalls, uh, mainly because your client devices, nobody cares, like you're very rarely running a server that accepts incoming connections. So your machine should just drop any incoming connections. Um, they're kind of an important part of network access uh, and mechanisms. The other mechanisms I will briefly mention are intrusion detection systems. So these are devices that monitor the traffic in your network and try to alert you of if it thinks that somebody has invaded your network. Um, so it's a mechanism that's trying to look at that detection piece. How do you do this? Are these devices easy to make or build? Yeah. I would assume it'd be pretty complex, but if you knew the makeup of like... Why? So why, why would you think it would be complex? Because you would have to know the entire like structure of which devices could be sending data to each other. So if uh, an attacker tried to pivot, it would notice. Yeah, and how would you? How do you distinguish between attacker traffic and benign traffic? Right. You think about a web server. You would probably want to detect a compromise of your web server, or a SQL injection, or a cross-site scripting against your web server. How do you detect all possible instances of that? This is actually a an area of. I'd say active research, also a commercial area. Snort is a common intrusion detection system. If you want to learn more about this, I recommend like uh, running Snort on your system and seeing what it says, what alerts it says, because you have this problem of false positives where it's looking for things, but they aren't actually problems. And you have this whole problem of how, so this is the mechanism to do this, but how do you actually define the policy of what constitutes um, an intrusion, right? That's actually the key problem here is that intrusion part. Detecting can be easy. Um, other things are related intrusion prevention systems. So the idea is if you detect an intrusion, like why might you want to detect versus prevent something? The prevention would be I see something happen, I just stop that connection from happening. Whereas detection says I log in somewhere. Why? Why? 
Yeah, if you have mistakes or your detection system makes mistakes, you'll block legitimate traffic. All right, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. We'll start on binaries on Tuesday. I'll record it for those that aren't here. See y'all later.